Okay, I was um, asked a few questions about uh, this, the total derivative, also known as the material derivative or the substantial derivative, all meaning the same thing, um, after the EGM-90 uh, Advanced Aerodynamics course this week. Remember that I'll be tweeting about this course using the hashtag EGM-90 uh, throughout the course of this term. Um, and as I was cycling home from the university towards the city centre, um, I passed by uh, Swansea's sewage works. And uh, if you do that cycle regularly, as I do the, si the cycle out to the Bay Campus from the city centre, you cycle past the sewage works, and depending on what the wind is doing, um, you pick up some of the smells from the sewage works. And it got me thinking about this thing called the total derivative and how perhaps I could explain this a little bit more clearly. So um, so I had this in my mind in my cycle home uh, from work one evening this week and I thought I'd put together a short video that hopefully clarifies um, this important idea that, that we need uh, to help us derive the, the momentum equations within the Euler and Navier-Stokes set. Um, so let's think about um, well let's think about uh, this is Swansea Bay here and we've got the Bay campus located out here and the city centre here somewhere and somewhere along here is Swansea's sewage works. Now of course inevitably wherever you have a sewage works you get the source of a smell and uh, this is what I could smell on my cycle home uh, which follows the uh, the bay around um, and of course a smell will the source of a smell will generate a smell field which will be strongest at the source of the smell um, and let's imagine we could think of this smell field being depicted using contour lines so along these lines that I'm drawing here there the, the smell concentration is constant. This is the source of the smell and let's call our smell field Q. So this is the source of the smell field here and these contour lines are lines of decreasing smell as you go out in this direction. Now this smell field uh, is varying in space so let's perhaps try and be a little bit more formal about this and introduce a coordinate system to our little problem. You might be wondering where I'm going with this, but don't worry, the material derivative, the total derivative will appear soon. So let's imagine we've got a Cartesian coordinate system x, y as so. Um, so this blue contoured line smell field is a function of space and time at any instant t. So this thing here, q, at any moment in time is a function of x and y. It's a field across space. But of course, because the distribution of the smell field will be a function of the wind and a function of what's going on at the source and a function of diffusion rates, then this field is also varying in time. And it's these two things, the fact that the total derivative measures the rate of change of a field as a an observer passes through that field, and the field is varying in both space and time, that leads us to the requirement of, of this definition of a total derivative. Now, my path home, as you cycle, it doesn't directly follow the coast path. It starts uh, it starts off following the coast and then it veers off in this direction and then it might do something like this. So this is my path passing through this smell field and I will be at these varying locations at intervals delta t that depend upon how fast I'm traveling, my velocity through this field. So I leave the campus, we'll call that A. I pass through the point where the smell is at its maximum as I pass by the sewage works. And then I arrive 
somewhere close to the city centre and the smell again has, has gone. So for me experiencing that smell field, so imagine you're passing with your you're you're with me traveling along that path. You're the moving observer and you want to know how the smell you experience Q varies with time. Well at point A it is very, very low, it increases to some maximum at B, and then decreases. So this might be when I'm at A, this is when I'm at B, and this is when I'm at C. And the total derivative asks the question, well, what is the rate of change of this smell field at any point in time? So, for example, at this point in time here, what is this rate of change of the smell field for me moving through the field? So there's a subtle difference here between the two cues I've drawn. This cue here is a field. It's a function of spatial distribution. And this cue here is the cue that's varying for the observer. It's the observed field for a moving observer following a predefined path through that field. So this is what the observer experiences. So, so far so good. And now we need to introduce a little bit of maths. Now, we know that we can take the grad of a field and at any point the, the grad operator uh, or grad Q basically is a vector pointing us in the direction of the steeper slope of that field, which of course is perpendicular to contour lines. So if we wanted to work if we wanted to compute the vector of this field Q, uh, the, the gradient of this field Q at this point here, well this is going to be a vector pointing in this direction. This is grad Q. Um, of course at this point when I'm at that point on my path, my velocity is a vector pointing as a tangent to my my path line, or if you're thinking this is a, as a fluid, my streamline, and I have vector v. So the gradient that I must be passing through, the spatial gradient, um, must be, so if we think about the rate of change of this field along this red line here, well, of course, that is going to be grad Q dotted with V. If that's not obvious, um, let's think about let's think about what the definition of course the scalar product is, because the angle uh, the angle between these two vectors is theta, and just by trigonometry we can see that the component of this gradient in the direction that I'm traveling is going to be is going to be the magnitude of grad Q times by the magnitude of the vector V cos theta. And that is, of course, the definition of the scalar product. So that's where that term uh, comes from. As we'll see in a moment, it turns out to be more convenient to write that the other way round. So this is exactly the same thing. So grad Q, which remember is a vector itself. We discussed this in the lecture this week. So grad Q, the gradient of a scalar field gives you a vector. So it's perfectly legitimate to, to scalar product or dot product that vector with the vector V. Um, and we can change the order of that operation without any problem. So that's the same as V dot grad Q. But that's only one component of what's happening here. That's, that takes into account the spatial variation of this field Q. Now the total derivative takes into account both the spatial distribution of this field Q um, and how you as an observer are affected by moving through that spatial field, but also there's this field is varying in time. Now the total derivative takes into account both these effects and the notation that we use for a total derivative capital dq by dt 
is this spatial variation, which we'll write as v dotted with grad q, plus the rate of change of time of that field at that point. So partial dq by dt, the rate of change of time holding your x and y position constant. So at that point in the field, the x and y coordinates that we're at at this point here, the rate of change of that field with respect to time plus the rate of change of that field because I'm moving through the field. So we can think of this as the convective component of the total derivative and the time derivative component. Now you can see that we've got a Q in both these terms here and it turns out that it's perfectly legitimate to actually uh, take that Q outside and, and, and turn what's left into a single operator and I'm going to change the order of this so that sometimes you'll see dQ by dt written in this form. So this is d by dt plus v dot grad of q. And it's useful to think of it like this because it helps us understand what this thing here is and the order of operation of this term here. Because now we can see that the total derivative is essentially your your time derivative component plus this convective derivative component, c component. And if you think for a moment about what this thing is, well we've scalar product a vector v with this this grad operator or, or the, the, the del function. And if you remember, we had a little think about in Cartesian coordinates what this thing is here. Well this is in Cartesian coordinates and two dimensions, d by dx in an i direction component where i is a unit vector in the x direction plus d by dy j where j is unit vector in uh, the y direction. Of course if we were thinking about this in three dimensions we could add on the third, the z component term there. And if that is dotted with v where v is u little v then this thing here is simply du by dx plus dv by dy, which of course is a scalar. So this thing here is a scalar operator, which acts on whatever comes after it. And if we think about it in this term, it frees us up to allow this Q field here. Now, in the, in the example that we've been thinking about, this Q field is a scalar field. It's just the smell intensity resulting from the smell originating from a sewage works. Um, but this could be a vector field. So we could just as easily write dV. So if we wanted to know the total derivative of the velocity field itself for an observer passing through this velocity field with speed v, we could substitute q for v and write d by dt plus v dot, gra uh, dot grad of v. And now this scalar operator operating on a vector quantity, don't be confused here that I've underlined this, that, doesn't, uh, that was just an underline not turning that q into a vector. Now we've got a scalar operator operating on a vector. Of course the time derivative is also a scalar operator, so this whole thing is a scalar operator operating on a vector and the output from this becomes a vector. And if you remember back to the origins of the momentum equations in the Euler and Navier-Stokes set, essentially all we're doing is we're saying well let's apply Newton's second law written in this form, F equals m a, remember this is Newton's second law and F whoop, and F is equal to M this should have been a dV by dt and now we've got a nice neat term for 
dv by dt. So we have f is equal to m dv by dt plus v dot grad and it's usual to put that in brackets to show that that's the operator acting on v and this is the starting point for your derivation using the Lagrangian approach, the approach where we follow a particle through a fluid field using the total derivative uh, to derive the momentum equations.